I want to talk to you about poverty. Poverty is someone sleeping on the streets in tattered clothes. It's usually someone who's drug addicted and they're often uneducated and lazy. Well, that couldn't be anything further from the truth because the working poor, they're all around us and you wouldn't even know it. I don't live in a typical poverty neighborhood. When you're living in an area like that, it's so easy to put the, put the mask on of being happy, putting the mask on of having it all together. Only, I think only one person in the building besides myself has a job. Everybody else is either uh, retired or disabled. Everybody there is poor. We don't have much we have to share in between. And even the ones who work, we often can't afford much of anything. Poverty is, um, for me, is um, just barely being able to survive, but doing everything you can to survive. We have a community garden for our, our, our building, and we actually all band together to take the vegetables. And um, if somebody goes in and picks the vegetables, they'll share it with everybody else to make sure everybody's got food on their table in the summer. We have simplified a complex issue. You see, we tend to lean on stereotypes because they're easier to digest. But poverty? Poverty's just not that simple. Poverty is a very complex, a very um, thousand tendril kind of problem. I think they call it wicked. We tend to just believe these misconceptions because it's easier. And it also allows us not to have to do anything about it. And that is a big piece that I feel we have to change. I've never known being comfortable, never known actually not worrying. There was once where it was the winter time and our power had gotten taken up. And us as children, we're nine years old, we don't understand why it's cold and why we have to wear winter jackets to go to bed and that kind of thing. You know, poverty can affect anybody. I had everything I needed to succeed, yet I ended up drug addicted and living on the street. There is no direct path to poverty. I mean, some are born into it, others fall into poverty because of illness, and there's some who are thrust into poverty because of a, a marriage that fell apart and they're left on a single income, and then there's the slippery slope of addiction. You know, I was always a really small and statured kind of kid, and I felt like I wasn't measuring up to the other kids, and I really, really took that hard. I really um, didn't like the person that I saw. When I discovered alcohol at an early age, like, it was like that magic elixir, you know, it, it allowed me to, to say what I want and to be this person. You know, we kind of lived paycheck to paycheck, and then we got married and had kids, and, and legal issues arose. Um, and he was removed from the family. Like, I can't say, I need to borrow money from you, and he can't send it to me. But I know what you're thinking. There are supports in place to help people when they're down and out. And we live in a wonderful country, and yes we do, and those supports do exist, but not really. They're flawed. And in some cases, those very same supports, they're holding people back. They're preventing progress. It took me six years to properly apply. Uh, the first time I ran into barriers where it was, well, you need a doctor, and my doctor had just quit on me, so I didn't have all of that. And then it was, well, most of your problems are mental health problems, and that's not a focus right now. And it's like, well, my mental health problems are affecting my physical. It's clear as day on paperwork. I was walking uh, with an assistive device, and then to be told by ODSP, well, that's not enough of a disability, sorry. It crushed me, and I almost gave up. Removing some of those barriers for people to access services, um, not focusing as much on they have a disability or um, they only meet a certain income threshold, like really focusing on the individual and their unique needs um, and understanding them kind of holistically. Oh yeah, the application process, it really broke me. I had struggled quite a while and I was, I was just mad and frustrated and felt like the world was against me because if the one thing that's supposed to help is denied to me, then what do I do at that point? Yeah, you know, I, I think if people are, are in a position to where they, you know, they feel like no matter how much they try, you know, they're, they're just digging a deeper hole into to where they're at and, and not, not able to pull themselves or create a better life for themselves. And that is because um, the services that are provided are just not sufficient. 
I see a big lack of mental health services, very much so. And I'm somebody who struggles with it. I've seen a lot of people struggle in my neighborhood, struggling to the point of like addiction and stuff. And they're poor, they, they have nothing. They even say that if they were, had better health, uh, mental health services, they probably wouldn't be struggling with their addictions. I'm not afraid to admit that I'm on antidepressants, uh, but it's really difficult to not get depressed about having depression when you go to the pharmacy and a two-month prescription of your medication is over $200. Why do they make them so expensive? Addiction brought me to, you know, really low levels of poverty. But there are definitely misconceptions, I think, with people who um, feel that it's a moral moral choice. Uh, I think that somebody who's not an addict will never be able to understand what it's like to be an addict just because their brain isn't wired that way. They, they don't know what it's like to have a beer and then not be able to stop. Just get a job, right? I mean, that's the magical solution we hear all too often that'll afford you enough money to live and reduce dependency on local community services. But is it really that simple? It's not that there's no jobs, there's lots of jobs. But when you're so limited as to what times you can work, I actually had to leave a job yesterday because I can't do it with my kids. Um, it was, you know, starting at seven o'clock in the morning on Mondays. Well, my kids don't leave for school until 10 after seven and almost nine o'clock. So I can't start work at seven o'clock in the morning. Even me personally, I face discrimination when going to get jobs and access services and stuff. My family members have, have had that. People in better situations, if you go to approach them for help and they're passing judgment before they get to know the situation, they have the ability to help, but because they've already decided upon meeting you what your story is without asking you, you don't get the help that you need. You know, the rising cost of living is really pushing a lot of people out on the streets. The amount that they're allotted or they're given doesn't even come close to, you know, the um, the average cost of, uh, of living in the city right now. These are serious, serious crises that we're undergoing. And now with everything having skyrocketed, we're gonna see more of it, more of it. And we need, we need good quality, safe housing for people. But where do we go from here? I mean, if we know the system is flawed, how do we shift from these stereotypes and acknowledge the lived experience of people in our region? Well, maybe that's just it. Now, maybe the first step is acknowledgement. Taking away the judgment is, is another piece. And seeing everybody as a human being who they need to be at that point in time. Those are pieces that I think can help shift. To me, the biggest part is, is taking that step back, really looking at ourselves, really deciding what we can do to make a difference. Not just to paint the wall a pretty color, but to really fix structural changes that need to happen in order for everybody to have quality in life. Listen, I know that this problem is complex. And I know that the solutions to the problem are equally as complex. But that doesn't give us the right to ignore the problem. Take the time to educate yourself on the realities of people living in poverty in our region. And then take that knowledge and share it with others. You know, if you, if you have lived experience and you've had to share your own story over and over and over again, like having someone else tell a general version of someone's story to their family members to educate them is so helpful. One might say that societal change starts at the dinner table. Have these tough conversations with your family, your peers, your employer, and most importantly, your government. If every individual takes the time to really look at who they are and where they would like to see our community grow and see what they can do to contribute to that, I think that's how we make change happen. It's not about just giving money, it's about restructuring our system. It includes policies, procedure, it includes laws and bylaws, and it, that's where it becomes really complex. But we all, as individuals, have a part to play in it and we have to accept our responsibility and, and to walk forward doing that. That's when it'll change. You know, I sit here now in a position where it's the longest I've been sober. Uh, it'll be a year next month. I've managed to get a job, get a vehicle, and, and, and I have my own apartment. Because of my personality, 
I'm more proud of other people's successes and I don't look at things I do as a, as a success. I mean, I'm sure other people would look at me and go, I'm really proud of you because of this, but I can't do that to myself. At this point, what motivates me is just remembering where I was, remembering, you know, my childhood and how much I wanted to give up as a kid. And I, as a kid, I thought I wouldn't even make it to the age I am now. And to be here, to be doing better than I ever thought I would be as a kid. Um, to know the people I know, to be working a job and enjoying it, younger me would, would not believe. And so to remember that at one point, this is more than I had wanted at the time. I'm doing better than I expected myself to do. And so that tells me, well, I can, I can continue. I can do even more. So I'll keep trying. I believe there is hope with all the issues. I think when we start believing that there's no hope, that's when we've given up on life. There are a lot of solutions. We just have to come together and work it. And it all starts with ourselves. So as long as we're starting with ourselves, there's always hope. The United Way wants our community to have a real conversation about poverty. For far too long, we have leaned on stereotypes that do not reflect the realities of people living in our region. Help the United Way make poverty in Cornwall, SDG, and Akwesasne unignorable.